everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming uh, to this lunchtime lecture, which marks the 100th anniversary of the first election of women to the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, the talk we're about to hear will look at the 20 years or so leading up to this, uh, the changing social habits of the time, and we'll introduce some of the most notable of those women elected, including Annie Maunder, Mary Proctor, and the intriguing Fiametta Wilson. Our speaker today is Dr. Mandy Bailey. Uh, Mandy obtained her PhD in the study of diffuse interstellar bands from Keele University in 2014, uh, investigating the nature of the diffuse interstellar medium in the local bubble and the Magellanic clouds. Since then, she's been working at the National Schools Observatory, developing a project for students on variable stars and she is also a tutor for the Open University. She has a great interest in outreach and education, uh, working as well on one of the current RAS 200 projects, which we have going, and she was also elected to the Society Council in 2011, becoming the RAS Astronomy Secretary in 2013. So with that, I'll hand over Mandy. Thanks very much, Morgan. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as Morgan said, I, I am an astronomer, a female astronomer. I'm also on the RAS Council. And during my studies, um, you know, I, I've also had a great interest in the history of astronomy. And during my studies, it was a bit of a bonus to discover that the work I was doing actually was building upon the work of another female astronomer who, during her own PhD, had discovered these diffuse interstellar bands. And we still don't know exactly what they are, but knowing that, it was an added bonus to my, my own studies and developed further my interest in the early women astronomers. So it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to share some of that story with you today. So yes, it is the 100th anniversary of the election of women to the RAS Fellowship. And this is on the 14th of um, yeah, the 14th of uh, January in 1916. The story doesn't start there, though. We need to go back quite a bit further. We need to go back to, actually, the 12th of January today, 196 years ago today, because this is when the RAS actually started. In, there was a meeting at uh, the Freemasons' Arms, which you see an image of here, in... Uh, Great Queen Street in Lincoln Fields in, in, in London, where 14 gentlemen met to look at the possibility of having a astronomical society. There was no thought given to whether or not women could or indeed should belong to this society. That was how things were at the time. The men did the science. It was the men that met to discuss the science, not the women. <coughs> You can see, possibly, it may be a bit dark, but hopefully you can see, this is the minutes of the, the first meeting of that um, uh, meeting in Lincoln in Fields, where uh, they, they would have met this evening at about in lunchtime over something to eat. Uh, they would have had the meeting before or maybe afterwards or during, sometime during that. But it was 14 gentlemen who met to discuss the, the possibility. Access to learning back then was quite difficult, certainly for, for women. If they did get any access to, to learning, their paid work was really in writing or in teaching, and there was not an awful lot of opportunity for them to take part in any scientific investigations. If they did, they needed the financial security of their family. They needed the support of their male relatives and basically they were their assistants they helped them to take the records they helped take the notes they assisted them but they weren't really doing any work for themselves there were some notable um, exceptions really and even people that didn't have an awful lot of education and if you are interested there is a very interesting story about mary anning although not astronomical, she was a fossil collector and dealer and a paleontologist, and from a very poor background, ended up becoming quite world famous. So she, that's a good story to, to look into. However, um, we're going back to the astronomy and um, the role of the women 
and how they were able to take part in their, how they would be able to in, indulge their interest, their scientific interest in what they were doing. And basically, they needed the security of a well-to-do family. Now, one such person who did that was Carolyn Herschel. Born in Germany, she was quite ill when she was younger and her growth was stunted. She was only just over four foot. Her parents didn't think that she was ever going to marry and they thought that it would be just as well if she went off and took, uh, went into service and started looking after people and they, they, she learned dressmaking and one thing and another like that. And she didn't really want to do that and her, her brother was living in, in Bath and in 1772, when she was 22 years old, she came over to England to live and work as his housekeeper. While doing that, she actually assisted in his work, taking notes of his uh, observations, helping him to catalogue the stars that he was looking at, and really being his right-hand woman doing a lot of the groundwork. Now, thankfully, she had a lot of support from her brother, Brother William, and she was encouraged to actually do a bit more. She'd shown an aptitude to doing this sort of work with him. She had shown some insight into what was happening. And he encouraged her, which was quite rare at the time. During her career, she actually discovered eight comets. She made a catalogue of nebula for which she was awarded a gold medal in 1828 from the Royal Astronomical Society. Now remember, she couldn't join the society. She couldn't join the society. It was not the done thing for women to be part of scientific societies. And yet her work was significant enough that the society honoured her by giving her the highest award that they could, the gold medal. It would be 161 years before the society awarded a medal of any description to another female astronomer. 161 years, and that was to Jocelyn Balbanel, and she was awarded the Herschel Medal. A gold medal wasn't awarded until seven years after that to Vera Rubin. So 161 years before another woman was honoured in that way by the society. But that's the way things were back then. It was the men that did the science, not the women. Despite their interest, despite their ability, despite the fact that they were probably doing an awful lot of the work alongside their male relatives. That gold medal would have raised the significance of Caroline's work. It would have made her an inspiration to her fellow female uh, counterparts at the time who were also had a scientific interest. In 1935, as a further honour, now the society had awarded her the gold medal, but they wouldn't let her join. She couldn't come to the meetings. Any of her work had to be discussed by her brother at such scientific meetings. So in 1935, to get around this problem, the, the, the society introduced the role of honorary membership. And it awarded the honorary membership to Carolyn Herschel and also to Mary Somerville. That's in 1935. Again, raising awareness of the work that they did. Now here is, I um, hope you can see that. It's a little bit clearer on the screen. This is a copy of uh, Carolyn Herschel's first discovery of a comet in August of 18... Uh, yeah, I, yeah, okay, you've got it. Um, so what she was observing, she had the opportunity to observe because her brother was actually away. So that meant that she could indulge in doing what she wanted to do. She wasn't taking his notes. He had encouraged her to do her own work. And she took advantage of him being away. And you can see that her work is quite detailed. It's dated. She's got her diagrams. She's made her notes. She's noted the observing conditions. She's, she described the star as, as a fuzzy star, an out-of-focus star, while the others were quite clear. 
So she could see that there was something different about this. <coughs> she tracked it throughout the night, making, making observations. She deduced whereabouts it was and, and the direction it was going in. And the following night, she, she repeated her observations. But what to do about it? I mean, this was before the, Royal, the Astronomical Society had actually begun. The Royal Society was, was uh, in existence. But women weren't supposed to be doing this sort of work, so what should she do? Her brother was away, the person that had encouraged her to do this sort of work. So she decided to write a letter to the secretary of the Royal Society, Charles Blagden. She decided to do this, and she was very careful in how she worded this so that she would actually get some recognition and, and actually get his attention. In consequence of the friendship which I know exists between you and my brother, that's how she started the letter. And then she ventured to trouble him with this account of an, uh, this imperfect account. So she did decide that she wasn't actually confident or showing that she wasn't perhaps confident and she calls it her imperfect account but to me looking at those notes it was pretty pretty clear to me that it was quite a perfect account of what she'd seen but this is how she couched the letter in fact she then explained that her, the way that she had done this was because her brother was away so she had the time to do this she wasn't taking up time when she should have been doing work for him he was away, so she was able to do this for herself. And this is how she became uh, acknowledged with this first work. So the honorary membership in 1835, as I said, that were as awarded to Karen Herschel and to Mary Somerville. Now, while I was researching this, I decided to, I could have gone back to the minutes of the society, but I also had the history of the society that was written in 1823 as a commemorative of the 100th anniversary, anniversary of the RAS. And I thought, well, it'd be interesting to see how then, just a few days, or a few years after, I should say, after a few years after the election of women to the society, it'd be interesting to see how this was portrayed in the history of the time. And really, it's just a very small paragraph in passing. It's quite a dense volume of notes written from the minutes. Um, so it, it, it was, you could miss it. You could easily miss this little paragraph that just happens to say two distinguished ladies were elected honorary members. And that's all that is mentioned about them. They are noted, but it's almost as in passing. So Mary Somerville, why was she elected? or given the honorary membership. She was a daughter of a vice admiral, and at 10 years old, her father declared her a savage. <laughs> so he sent her off to boarding school for a year to sort of try and sort her out. Um, she there, she learnt the basics of uh, education, reading and writing, and on her return from that, she learnt Latin from her, her uncle, and she showed an aptitude for maths, and she taught herself geometry. Now, sadly, at about this time, her younger sister died. And for some reason, her parents decided that her education had, made, had some effect and had some cause for the death of the younger sister, and decided it was far too dangerous for Mary to continue studying in case she should die too as a result of her study, and they forbade her to study. Being the savage that she was, she uh, ignored them. And she continued to study in a, a little bit of secrecy and uh, managed to really get to grips with the mathematics and the geometry that she was looking at. She went on to study in London and she came into contact and collaboration with many people, eminent people in the scientific community here in London. The book that she wrote that really got her noticed and her fame was it was a translation of Laplace's Mechanique Celeste. She called it The Mechanism of the Heavens. She translated this work and she popularised it. She had a skill for being able to explain to people 
in plain language that they could understand, and she made astronomy accessible to people. And this work became quite famous for her, and it was the reason that she was actually awarded the honorary membership, because it was widely <coughs> used, not just by the women of the time, but by the men too, even though she was not allowed to join the Royal Astronomical Society. This is a copy of the front of the book of, of the, uh, the issue that Mary Somerville donated to um, the Royal Astronomical Society. So the honorary membership, those were the first two in 1835, but there were also a few more between 1835 and 1916. Anne Sheepshanks, again, I looked into the history of the RAS to find out about her rather than going back to the minutes just to see how this was, was noted. And again, it's only in passing. I couldn't work out when she was actually elected as an honorary member. And it is just barely mentioned when her death is noted in 1876 <coughs> that she was an honorary member of the society. Now, she was a very wealthy lady. <coughs> and a lot of what she did were bequests to the RAS and to Cambridge. And in fact, she gave Cambridge £10,000 on the death of her brother, which a tremendous amount of money in these days, never mind back then. And this was to show how much she respected her brother's work and interest in astronomy. The work and the money that she left to, the, to Cambridge was able to give uh, sponsorships and um, fellowships to people to, to continue to study. Lady Margaret Huggins. She was the wife of the astronomer Sir William Huggins. For many years, it was assumed that she was simply his note taker. Not that she did any work of her own. She simply did as she was told by her husband. Married in 1875, it was 1889 before she appeared as a co-author in any of their works. This did not reflect their lab books where it was obvious that it was actually Lady Huggins who had the in innovative ideas and the experimentation of the work that they were doing. It was her ideas, it was her work. She could not become a member of the society. She could not attend meetings to put forward her science, so her husband had to do it for her. That's the way it was. That's what they expected. That's what the norm was. It's a shame that she had to wait so long. Obviously, her husband was a bit more keen to keep some of the glory for himself, um, unlike the Herschels, who were very keen to encourage the women to take on the extra work. Agnes Clark, another of the honorary women. She was mainly a writer and again had a great skill, like Mary Somerville, of being able to put into plain English and explain so that people could actually get access to astronomy, get access to the information. Her first major work was on the uh, Copernicus in Italy, which was published in 1877 in the Edinburgh Recorder. She went on to write seven books and publish 55 other articles. She was quite prolific in her writing, and it was for this reason and for it expanding along the work of astronomy that she was also given an honorary membership. Annie Jump Cannon, quite a number of you will probably have heard of Annie Cannon. She was one of Pickering's women, one of the Harvard computers in, in America. She did a lot of the tedious work going through the photographic plates, cataloguing the stars when trying to create the Henry Draper catalogue. She worked with Pickering to create the 
still a classification based on temperature of the stars. The O, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. She did a lot of variable star work, and she's very famous for that as well. So, in America, there was more opportunity for women to do that than there were than there was in the UK. But even so, they were poorly played. It was tedious work, and they were not actually given a very high standing. Another of the honorary fellows, Wilhelmina Fleming, also worked at Harvard. She was also one of the computers with Pickering. She also worked on the Henry Draper catalogue. During her work, she catalogued 10,000 stars. 10,000 stars. That is no mean feat. 59 nebulae, 310 variable stars, and 10 nova. The amount of work that she was putting out was quite phenomenal. And yet she could not join a society in her own right. She was an honorary member. She couldn't <coughs> attend the meetings. This doesn't really seem very fair, does it? She also discovered the Horsehead Nebula in 1888. Now, this was a plate that was actually taken, the, the, the photography was taken by Edward Pickering's brother, William Henry Pickering. Um, and it was Wilhelmina Fleming <coughs> that noticed the Horsehead Nebula in this image. When this was catalogued by the indexers, however, they just attributed it to Pickering. They failed to mention Wilhelmina. They failed to mention it was the brother, William Henry. So actually, many people thought this was Edward Pickering's discovery. And this was never put right. By the time the second edition of the catalogue had been uh, published, the fame of the Harvard computers had grown. And they were able to stand up and say, look, that's my discovery. And they were actually credited with their own discoveries by that time. However, Wilhelmina and William Henry Pickering were never credited properly with discovering this nebula. <coughs> so now we come a little bit closer to time, the new society. So that society is changing at this time. You know, education is becoming more accessible. It was... <coughs> A turning point, the late 19th century, it became fashionable for women to actually get an education. The wives, daughters and sisters were staying at home, they were looking after the staff, they had some responsibility, so they had some extra confidence about what they were doing. It was thought that if they had a better education that they would be able to get a better husband. But to be fair, this was mostly in the humanities and, and especially in their decorum rather than the sciences. But if they had a supportive family or indulgent parents that they could wrap around their little finger, they were allowed to perhaps indulge a little bit in the scientific pursuits. It was a turning point. It was a turning point. The Liverpool Astronomical Society was started in 1881 and it accepted women from the start. The British Astronomical Society grew out of the Liverpool Astronomical Society in 1890 and that too accepted women from the start. Things were changing. Social scene was changing. Women were being acknowledged that they had a real role to play. And 1905, thanks to these amateur societies, there were well over a hundred women astronomers in Britain, but not one of them could join the Royal Astronomical Society. Now, one of the women who took advantage of this new, um, new thinking, that the, the, the more liberal, the more enlightened society of the late 19th century, was Elizabeth Brown. She was the daughter of a wine merchant and meteorological recorder, and she assisted her father's work. Pretty much like her predecessors, Caroline Herschel, uh, doing the assisting rather than the work itself. 
However, on her father's death, she was able to indulge in what she had grown an interest for, what she discovered for herself, and what she was doing a little bit of when she could when her father was alive. She became very interested in the solar observing. And this is what she took to. She lived south of Birmingham, and she would make the round trip to Liverpool to go to the astronomical society there, to the solar section. She became a director of the solar section of the Liverpool Astronomical Society. So here we have a woman. She was of independent means, so she was able to indulge what she wanted to do. But she was beginning to do it. She was beginning to be a trailblazer like Karen Herschel before her and Mary Somerville and the others. Trailblazing and showing women that it was possible that you could do this sort of work if you wanted to and if you had the, the means and the opportunity to do so. During her travels, she met up with Walter Maunder, collaborated with him, and together, really, they were the foreigners, they were the people that set up and started the British Astronomical Society in 1890. And Elizabeth Brown became the solar section director of that, which she held until 1899. Things were changing, changing quite dramatically. So what about the Royal Astronomical Society? Perhaps it was time for them to have a change of heart and to think about allowing women to join the society. But we need to go back to 1886 for this and, and to a woman called Isis Pogson and the problem with pronouns. Now Isis Pogson, her father was Norman Pogson. He was director of the Madras Observatory and she, while over in Madras, she worked with him, assisting him, there's a common theme here, assisting her male relative in the work that he did. However, she was paid for this work. She was given the princely sum of 150 rupees. It was about the sort of wage a cook would have over in Madras. So again, not very highly rated, but she was paid for her work as an astronomer, cataloguing, reducing the data, making all the detailed notes. She was put forward by three fellows in 1886 for fellowship of the Royal Astronomical Society. The council at the time had to think quite hard about this. This, what, this hadn't been done before. This was not the normal thing to do. What were they going to do? They did think that perhaps if a woman could show that she could do everything that she should be able to do as a fellow, do all the duties as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, then perhaps there was no reason why she should not be able to become a fellow. But they were a bit uneasy about this. It was quite groundbreaking. We weren't sure quite what to do. And they took a second opinion and the second opinion investigated the charter of the Royal Astronomical Society. And throughout the charter of the Royal Astronomical Society, it only mentions he, not she. They took this to mean that as it only mentioned he, that only men could actually join the society, that women were not allowed. It wasn't in the charter. There was no provision in the charter for women to be fellows. They spoke to the people who had proposed Isis Pogson and explained this to them and said, well, look, really, do you know, it says he in the charter. This really means you know, women are not allowed. Wouldn't it be awful if you put ISIS up for election and the fellows just wouldn't go with it because of we have this pronoun he in the, in the charter? So these three fellows thought about it and perhaps they, they weren't quite ready, perhaps they weren't quite sure of the, their grounds and they decided to withdraw ISIS from uh, a proposal and she was not put forward for election. Now it wasn't just the RAS that had this problem with pronouns. The Geological Society also had a similar 
uh, problem with pronouns in its charter where it was only he and actually they didn't change it until 1919. So uh, we, we did get there a bit before them. So this wasn't uncommon, that's how it was, but that's the way it was. This charter was drawn up way back in the early 1800s and that's the way it was then. It was the men that did the science and not the women. So that was that with Isis Pogson for a while. It would be, she did become elected fellow of the RAS in 1820 eventually, when she was married Mrs. Kent, but she did eventually become a fellow of the society. It took a long time. A few years later, the first woman to stand for election to, and actually go through were Elizabeth Brown, the aforementioned uh, director of so the director of the BAA, <coughs> Annie Russell, later to be Annie Maunder, and Alice Everett. This came about really because of Walter Maunder, who had decided that the BAA in 1890 was accepting women. So things had changed quite a lot since Isis Pogson, you know, six years previously. And it was about time that the RAS actually followed suit. So he proposed with some others, that these three should stand for election. This time, they were not put off. The council did say the same thing. Oh, well, it says in the charter, he, the pronoun he, and you know, what if they didn't get it, and all the rest of it. But no, times had changed. There was a lot more education out there for women. There was a lot more work being done by women. The amateur societies were accepting them, so you know it was being done. So they went to election. However, before the election, there was some great debate where the president decided it would throw it to the mercy of the fellows, explaining what was in the charter and the pronoun he, the fact that it wasn't actually admitting you know, it didn't seem to admit the fact that they could have women in the society. Um, also pointing out that the fact that the BAA and the Liverpool societies had accepted women uh, from the word go. So there was the two sides to the coin and it, there was some heated debate and decided to, to leave it to see what the fellowship thought about it. Now during this debate, one fellow this is a lovely quote from Mary Brooks, Brooks' book. Uh, one fellow who was a professional artist, not a professional astronomer, he was a fringe astronomer, thought it was quite preposterous to, to allow women into the meetings and gave this wonderful quote saying it was practically a proposal to introduce into these dull, dull meetings a social element. That was really, really unjust very unjust, very hurtful. What happened was the three women failed to get the votes they required. They required three quarters of the votes in order to be elected to fellows of the society and all three failed to get that three quarter vote. This is really an unjust remark by somebody who was not a professional astronomer but Maybe things weren't changing but for everybody at the time. There was a lot of change in the way women were being perceived, but obviously there were still some people that didn't think this was the done thing. <coughs> now remember, he was talking about people like Annie Maunder, or Annie Russell as she was then. Annie Maunder was working with... Alice Everett at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. She was doing the work of a computer like her counterparts over in America. She was doing groundbreaking work. They weren't paid very well. In fact, 14-year-old boys working at the observatory were paid more and had more responsibility and, and more um, respect than the, the women <coughs> computers at, at the Royal Observatory, which is very sad, but that's the way it was. However, she went on to discover many things and she went on to observe, in particular, uh, solar eclipses 
uh, as part of the BAA exhibitions, expeditions. Um, she went then with her husband uh, to Mauritius, to, to all over the world, looking at these solar eclipses and recording them. She did a tremendous amount of work. It was a bitter blow that they didn't get through on the election. It was a bitter blow particularly to Elizabeth <coughs> Brown, who at 62 had done a tremendous amount of work. But she didn't complain. She was used to the old way of things where, as honorary fellow, or the honorary fellows earlier, they didn't complain. They had shown their intellect. They had still kept their social decorum and therefore were able to be accepted into the society of uh, the scientific society at the time. But they knew their place. And really, Elizabeth Brown still had that sort of feeling. So she didn't really, or not in public, did she, she didn't complain. I'm pretty sure she might have had a bit of a moan to her best friend. I think I would have done. But these were the sort of women that were being excluded from fellowship at the RAS when amateur male fellows could join. However, that's what happened, and the idea of women being fellows was laid to rest for some 30 years. But the council realised that really this wasn't a very good thing to have done. This wasn't a very progressive way of looking at things, and really they ought to do something about it. So they came up very quickly with a stopgap solution. And what they did was they awarded cards of admission. This, the cards of admission would be given to women on a yearly basis. Women who were of the right standing, had the right work, had the right uh, approach to the scientific, people who were worthy. And so for many years, this is what happened. Every year they would get their cards of admission. This would allow them into the meeting so they could at last start to take part in the meetings themselves. They could put their own science forward. They didn't have to rely on their husbands or their brothers or their uncles or any male colleague to do it for them. And they could take part in the scientific meeting. So this was a very good stopgap and it worked rather well for about 130, uh, 130 years, for about 30 years. The social scene was changing again. War had broken out. We're moving forward now to, to closer to 1916. War had broken out. <laughs> the suffrage movement was working hard for women's rights. There was a great change in, in the work that women did. Women were mm -hmm. taking on the roles that men had done. Men had gone off to, to war. Men had gone off to the trenches. Things were changing. And it became time to have a bit of a rethink. And in March of 1915, Council had decided that they would put to the fellowship that they ought to now accept women fellows into the society. They'd already been and spoken to the Privy Council. They had taken advice. There was a draft petition to the King. There was a draft supplementary charter. When it went to the AGM, not one voice spoke out against this. Not one person objected to the idea. And when the vote was taken, 59 to 3 voted in favour of accepting women into the society and directed the council to ensure the steps were taken to allow this to be possible. Ensure the steps were taken to alter the pronoun he. Well, the war was going on, so here we are. We, in, we need to go to the Privy Council. We need to petition the King. You'd think they'd have more important things to think about, wouldn't you? Um, but things were changing, and it was now becoming quite important that this actually be done. And it shows the significance of the work that the women were doing, that it was considered important enough to interrupt the, the work war, <coughs> or the war work, and actually put this in motion. It cost £100 to change the charter. That is equivalent of some £9,000 in today's money. I'm not quite sure what the current treasurer would think if we were to ask him to spend £9,000 to change the pronoun 
in the bylaws, um, I don't know. But that was what was done then. The RAS had actually been quite supportive of the government during the war effort and they'd made loans to the government and had loaned equipment as well as money. So in 19, on the 5th of June 1915 at Westminster, the charter, the supplementary charter was awarded, allowing women to join the society. Where, where it said he, it was now to be read as also she. And that is what happened. When the council met again and started the next season in the November of 1915, the president announced to the fellowship that the, the Royal Charter had been received and that women could be put forward for election. And in 1916, January 1916, 14th of January 1916, four women were put forward for election and they were elected. During the remainder of 1916, a few more women were elected into the fellowship of the RAS. Not all of them doing work of any particular note. Some of them were, some of them were quite well known, some of them were very active in the BAA. But generally they weren't doing anything more spectacular than their male counterparts. But these were the first women that were allowed to actually join the society. These were the first women that had actually been able to trailblaze the way through and open the door for other women to follow. There aren't that many photographs actually left from that time. We couldn't get photographs of everybody. But this is a photograph of Grace Cook. She was a director of the, uh, so of the meteor uh, section in the at the BAA. This is Mary Proctor, who was a prolific writer in the same way as her predecessors, um, popularised astronomy and uh, made it accessible um, to, to, the, to the wider uh, public. Margaret Mayo was a mathematician. She was one of the first members of the London Mathematical Society. Where she, her degree involved mathematical astronomy. And Francesca Herschel, the granddaughter of William Herschel, the great niece of Caroline Herschel. She was the curator of the Herschel papers and the Herschel instruments. And then we have Fiametta Wilson. Well, I said not all the women did anything of any note or were quite noticeable, noticeable but Fiametta Wilson was quite a character. She joined the BAA in 1910. She was co-director of the meteor sector. She observed aurora. She, she observed meteors. The war was on, but that was not going to stop her. She was a very determined and committed astronomer. She built a platform in her London home so that she could raise herself up above the skyline, above the houses and above the trees, so that she could better observe. She recorded in 10 years some 10,000 meteors. She accurately predicted the, or calculated the paths of 650 of those. She was quite a character, as I say. She, she would not stop just because the war was on she wasn't going to stop observing this was important work that she had to do and she very narrow, narrowly very narrowly got um, escaped being arrested as a spy because when she was observing uh, the zeppelins all around her bombs dropping and one thing and another um, she was using her flashlight to make the the, the notes of her, her meteors that she was recording and one of the wardens thought she was signalling signaling the Germans and um, almost arrested her for espionage. Adding to that the fact that she was a very gifted linguist and she could speak Italian and German, I wonder how she managed to actually talk her way out of being convicted as a spy, but somehow or other she did. She also... She also... Um, narrowly escaped being bombarded with shrapnel by the bombs that were dropping. Nothing was going to stop her from doing the work that she wanted to do. Quite a formidable woman. 
So then we come on a little bit later on. That wasn't the end of the, um, the struggle. That was just the beginning of it. Things did get easier. Women were more acceptable into scientific society. Um, but this is the one Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin that possibly got away. She was a member of the Royal Astronomical Society. She was elected in 1922 when she was doing her studies at Cambridge. But she realised that in the UK still, all that was probably open to her was a, a life of, and a career in teaching. And she wanted to do more. America had more opportunities, so she went to America and in, in, enrolled in a postgraduate course in America. She obtained a PhD. She looked up at the abundances of hydrogen and helium in stars and actually deduced the conclusions were that the sun was mostly made of hydrogen and therefore very unlike the Earth. This went against what people thought at the time. It was quite shocking that this, this, she should come up with this and it was really quite trailblazing. She was awarded her PhD and therefore with that PhD, women were accepted into the mainstream of the scientific community. She had made a breakthrough, an important scientific breakthrough. The quote there by Mary Brooke says that she was an astronomer who happened to be a woman <coughs> and not a curiosity in the world of men. And this was the turning point. It made a big difference. She was also a trailblazer for the women to follow. Now, since then, there have still been um, some obstacles in the way of people trying to do work in, in, in science, but thankfully they're getting less and less. When Cecilia accepted the Henry Norris Russell Prize from the American Astronomical Society, this is the quote that she gave. And I think the first part of this quote holds true now, still does, always has done and always will do until the end of intelligent life in the universe. The thrill of being the first person in the history of the world to see something or to understand something is something that you will never, ever forget. Nothing, no experience can compare to that. The reward of the old scientist seeing a vague sketch grow into a masterly landscape, well, maybe that hasn't always been so true. Hopefully, it is becoming true more often. And in a 100 years' time, let's hope that this is the norm and it is the truth and will remain the truth. There are a lot of things changing. There are a lot of obstacles that are being overcome. And in a 100 years' time, I hope it is the, the, I hope it is the case that there are no obstacles to anybody wishing to pursue a scientific occupation. I won't be around to see that, um, and time will tell. But let's hope that is the case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mandy. That was a fascinating talk, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, we do have some time for questions, so I would like to open it up. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Mandy? Plenty of time, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> One here. Uh, if we could wait until you do have the microphone so we capture it for the recording. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Um, in the world of astronomy today, what is the ratio, just approximately, of, of young females to young men who've got an interest in a study? Yeah. If, if you're talking um, young women to, to younger men, I mean, that is something that is growing. Um, I think on the whole, the proportion is somewhere in the region of 30 to 70, I think, roughly. Um, it seems to be the case that although earlier in, in schools there might be more even 50-50 uh, split, that going through to the professional world of astronomy that it does tend to fall off a bit for various reasons still but um, it is certainly improving there are a lot more women in astronomy now obviously but um, you know there are not that many in, in the higher in the higher roles but it is improving Uh, 
Thank you very much for the interesting talk. If you had to pick one of the women who um, might have been elected but were unable to be elected because um, before the uh, women were allowed, um, which one would you pick as the most deserving? I think it would have to be Elizabeth Brown. Um, I, th I think for, for the time she did a tremendous amount of work. She was quite pioneering in setting up the BAA with Walter Maunder. Um, and I think that the determination that she showed, the, the fact that she would travel so far to attend a meeting to Liverpool just to, just to get the information that she wanted to. Um, I, I think they could have all uh, would, would justly deserved, but I think she probably went just that little bit further. Thank you very much for your talk. You. Um, you've spoken about Great Britain, but what about continental Europe and America in terms of uh, accepting female scientists? I think um, I haven't researched that a great deal. I mean, America certainly were a bit ahead of Great Britain. Uh, they did have women colleges before we did. Um, they did have the, the Harvard computers were in existence before, before us. So I think they did actually lead the way a little bit. And certainly with Cecilia, she, she was told from Cambridge that she had more... Even in the 1920s, she had more opportunities if she went to America and left the, left the UK, left Britain. So in, in that respect, she was the one that got away from us. She was quite a, a turning point of, of women. Um, if you go back, I mean, you could go back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, and there was a very influential woman back then, Hypatia. Um, but... You know, there, I think there were always more men, even in, in, in Europe, than there would have been um, uh, women. And again, I think the women probably helped, helped the men. It was the, the, the nature of the time. Do you have any connection with the Countess of Ross of Burr Castle? in Ireland? I don't know. Would you know anything about her? Um, off the top of my head, no, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I don't know. Uh, the Egyptians, about 4,000 plus years ago, were amongst the earliest astronomers. Mm -hmm. um, are there now any astronomical societies in the Arab world? And if so, are there women members? <laughs> what a good question. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there must be. I'm sure there must be um, uh, societies. Um, I certainly know that there are in, in uh, Iran. Um, I have some collaborators in Tehran. Um, there, there must be, but I have absolutely no idea what the, the statistics are. Uh, but that's, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a slightly trivial question, but I think you said Elizabeth Brown was the daughter of a wine merchant. Yes. So that could be Brown Brothers and Rudd, could it not? <laughs> if they if they were around, it was I founded in the end of the seventeenth century. Uh, where, 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 if and they were a, a famous wine uh, supplies to the Queen. Oh. The reason uh, I ask is the headquarters is in Basingstoke. I live near Basingstoke, and we're always looking for things to uh, enhance the reputation of Basingstoke. Basingstoke. <laughs> If you can claim a um, brown. Well, if they, I, 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 it would be, well, you could look into it. Um, it might possibly be. I, I believe that they were uh, around the Worcester area, if I'm, if I'm remembering right, but off the top of my head, I think that's where they started. Now, if, if, if I they... Shall, I should follow up. Yes. Yeah, well, do let me know. Do let me know. All right.
Hello, just to say that if anyone would like to look at any of the books by people mentioned in Man Mandy's talk, like the copy of Mary Somerville's uh, Mechanics, Me of, the Mechanics heavens, of the yeah. Heavens. That, that's on display in the library, and you're very welcome to come over and have a look at the books on display. Okay, well, can we thank, thank Mandy again? Thank you very much.